right, well, welcome to part two of our series called Choose Joy. We just kicked it off last week, and man, we started off worship with some joy, didn't we? Who's excited to be church at church this morning? I'm glad you're here. Wait, well, hey, actually, hold your clap for a second. I want to get you to clap for me for somebody special, and that is those who are joining us online. And I have somebody specific today joining us. That is my grandmother who lives out in Arizona, Pastor Zandy's mom. She is in Arizona joining us today. So, Vineyard, would you help me welcome those who are joining us online? We're glad you're here. Hey, Grandma. <laughs> well, last week we kicked off this series, and we talked about choosing joy. And really what this series was birthed out of was prayer. You know, at the end of the year, I like to go into prayer and really seek what the Lord has for me, my family, and this church. And I really walked away feeling that this 2021, I really felt God had a year of great joy in store for Vineyard. And that doesn't mean there wasn't going to be challenges, but I really believe there are great blessings. And we talked about that a little bit last week, that 2021 is a year where we can choose to have the joy the Lord has for us. Because the Lord knows 2020 was difficult. Amen? It was difficult. And something the pastors and I realized through that pandemic was that this church is not going away. This isn't going away. Us gathering together, coming together. I mean, I love that we have technology, and I think it's through the power of technology that the Lord can overcome many things and work through that. But there's something about coming together and gathering that there's just power in, in corporately gathering. And even more so, we discovered that because we did uh, – close our physical location for a little bit, but we met online, we, we discovered the pastors talking that, man, we miss church also because it was a joyful part of our week. It was enjoyable. And some of you haven't experienced church that way. And I'm telling you, if you haven't, you're doing church wrong. Church shouldn't be endured, it should be enjoyed. And if you haven't experienced that feeling where you come into church and go, whoa, man, this place has changed my life and I'm changing the lives of others. That's where real joy is found. And I want to help you step into that. I want to help you find that joy that uh, we have at church every week. It's a powerful part of it. So I kicked off this series last week with a passage in Isaiah, which is on your outlines. It's Isaiah 61. And this is Isaiah. He's writing about Jesus in this passage. And he's talking about what Jesus brings for us. He, Jesus came to give us what the oil of joy for mourning the oil of joy for mourning. What does an oil do? It soothes. It coats. You know, what does it coat? It coats mourning. Those areas of pain, the problems we have, the depression, the sadness, all of those things. Jesus came to cover those things. And I really believe we're coming out of a mourning pandemic, a mourning epidemic. Where, and you can look this up. Studies show that last year there was more loneliness, more depression, more people took their lives then in the past several decades, there was more people getting medicated. And if you weren't medicated on medicine, you were medicating other ways, binge watching, binge eating, binge drinking. You know, churches were closed, but the lines around the ABC store were very long. So people, it was a morning pandemic in my mind. That's what I see. And we also talked about last week how the spirit of heaviness, see all these things, it's not just economical or political or you know, what new virus is in there. You know, it, there's actually a spiritual element as well. There's a spirit of heaviness. There's a spirit of heaviness that, and it's not, I'm not saying there aren't circumstantial things, but there's a spiritual element as well, and we don't want to forget that. And see, Jesus, he came to replace those things. He came to say, hey, you don't have to live with that spirit of heaviness. You don't have to carry that mourning. No, I bring the oil of joy and the garment of praise, which covers those things. And the revelation of this series is that Jesus brings those things to us in the midst of our mourning and in the midst of the heaviness. But here's the kicker. We have to make a decision. We have to choose to want it. We have to choose to want that joy that the Lord brings us. We talked about last week also how one of my favorite characters, Paul, you know, Jesus is my all-time hero, but Paul in the New Testament, man, he has the best attitude. He wrote most in the New Testament, and you can see it all over the place. This dude has a great attitude, and he had a rough life. He got the lashings Jesus got. Jesus got 39 lashings. Uh, Paul got that five times in his life. Paul was also shipwrecked on his way to court to be executed, floating like a cork in the sea for a night, wondering if sharks are going to eat me, makes it to an island, climbs on, builds a fire, snake bites him. Dude can't win, man. We clarified last week, we clarified last week how he got stoned, not recreationally, with rocks. I don't care what y'all say. That's funny, man. That's funny. <laughs> This dude had it rough, yet when you read his readings, he was so joyful. He chose 
joy. He made a decision to choose joy. And he says we can make that decision as well. No matter how bad it gets, we can choose joy. Paul, who wrote 2 Corinthians, says this, and I highlighted the key word, sad yet joyful. I have every reason to be miserable, sorrowful, yet I'm joyful. I have nothing. I'm poor. I don't have a dime to my name, yet I'm making others rich. I don't have anything, but I have everything. I want us to be yet people. I want us to be, in spite of my circumstances, yet I'm going to choose joy. What do you do to people like this? The short answer is nothing. You can't do anything to people like this. And I want you to get there so bad. I want you to get there. And that's what this whole series is about, is helping you take those steps to get there. So we have to make some choices, though. That's the reality, is we have to make some choices. And we talked about last week how the first choice, that's what we call the message, the first choice you have to make is you have to decide that we're going to be a people who don't act first. We're going to be a people who pray first, that we pray first. And if you missed that message, I encourage you to go watch it online. It's very powerful because it really is the first choice. And this week, we have another choice to make. And I'm just going to be straight up with you. This week's choice is the hardest choice. It's the hardest one. That's why I snuck it in the middle. (laughs) Next week is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. But this week, you really have to make this choice. And it's the most difficult choice. And it's the choice of purity. It's the choice of purity. See, some of us don't have real authentic joy because we're carrying too much stuff around in us. Let me say it this way. You're worried about getting caught by your boss. You're worried your spouse is going to find out you're doing that thing you probably shouldn't be doing. You're worried your kids are going to find out about that thing. You're worried your friends are going to, and you're driving around sweating, wondering, am I going to get caught? And that's the enemy's plan for you. I'm telling you straight up, to carry that shame and guilt every day, to just be living life wondering, Man, when, am I, when is this going to come out? It's going to catch me sometime. And just living that way, that's the enemy's plan for you. See, Jesus, he loved to describe the enemy, that is Satan, because there is an enemy. Scripture talks about it, Satan, the devil. His favorite word to describe Satan was a thief. A thief. He, he takes, he takes. And see, the enemy, Satan's got, he's clever, he's not stupid. He's not just a thief, he's also a good liar. And he's lied to so many people And the lie he's planted in many is that God is a taker. Man, if I follow God, he's going to take my fun. He's going to take my partying. He's going to take my drinking. He's just going to take from me. But that's not true. I'm telling you, that's not true. See, the enemy, Satan's a taker. God's an adder. He's an adder. Jesus came to give life and life to the full. It's the enemy who takes from you. And I have some friends that talk to me, and I talk to them about God, and they say, Samuel, if I follow God, if I go all in, I'm good with God at a distance. I have, I'm friends with him, but if I go all in, I know I'm going to be sterilized down to a level of boredom until I get to heaven. And Samuel, I'm not sure about heaven either. When I see it on TV, it's clouds, and I have a white robe and a harp, and I'm in a choir. I can't even sing. And I look at him, I say, no, friends, that's hell. (laughs) That's what hell looks like. No, if you read scripture, heaven looks nothing like that. It's so much better than that. And see, the enemy's done such a good job, though, hasn't he, at convincing us that God takes from us. And that's the devil's plan is to lie and keep you paralyzed in that shame and that guilt and to keep you away from God. That's his plan. You know, some of you might know the story. Some of you might not. When I was in college and undergraduate, I really lost my way. I lost uh, just my sight on God. And, you know, I am a people pleaser, if you know me. That's one of my idiosyncrasies of my personality. Uh, I like to please people. Uh, But it also makes me adaptable with people in social circles. So in college, I had a pretty big social clique, and I knew how to be the person I needed to be to fit in. You can see how that can be dangerous quickly. Well, in college, the person I needed to be was this party person. So every single weekend, I would go out partying Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and just get drunk every single weekend. And that was the gauntlet I ran every week with them. And then there was a period of my college tenure where I got into a group of pot smokers, and I became friends with these kids who smoked weed, and so, I, hey, to be a part of them, I picked that up too. And, you know, when I would come back to Virginia Beach, whether I was on break or whatever, I would be here, and I would make sure I was in church on Sunday. And see, I did that because I was carrying that shame and that guilt with me. And I knew that I was playing games with God. 
that I really wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. And really, it's very sad, but I got to this place where it was a scale in my head that, hey, I know what I did this past weekend, so maybe I'm going to sit a row closer up front this weekend in church. <laughs> that's, where, that's what it became for me. And here's the worst part is I was good at church too. I knew how to put it on. I knew the clothes to wear. I knew the words to the songs. I knew the Bible verses. Maybe it's because I'm a preacher's kid. I don't know. But I knew how to put it on. But I was smiles on the outside, miserable on the inside. Miserable, heavy, heavy. That's the best way I can describe it. As I was carrying all this shame and this guilt, I was living this double life, really, this double life. And it was tearing me apart. And it's only by the grace of God that near the end of my undergraduate uh, degree path that God really got a hold of me through a pastor who spoke a message and spoke on Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus says in that passage, if you know it, he says, man, there's people, he's going to talk to some people who are standing before him in heaven and say, they're going to say, didn't I, didn't I do miracles for you? Didn't I heal people? Didn't I cast out demons? Didn't I do all this stuff for you? And Jesus says, I never knew you. I never knew you. And it just rocked me in that moment. Whoa. And the pastor said, that means I, I never had a personal relationship with you. And that just hit me. I remember kneeling on the carpet and crying and just, oh my gosh, I've lost that. The most important part of my faith. And so in that moment, I surrendered my life back to God and I just felt this relief, this wa just this relief washing over me. And really what it was, it, it was the shame and the guilt falling off of those decisions, of those things I had done. Because I remembered and discovered in that moment, Romans 5, Christ loved us when we were still sinners. That even in all of that junk I was in, God still loved me. And just the relief of that, oh, the shame and the guilt, it went away. And see, I want that for you, my friends, because on the other side of that is true, authentic joy. But that's the power of sin, in all honesty. And so I wanted to start off this message by giving you three things that sin does. The first thing that sin does is that sin really steals our joy. Sin zaps our joy. It takes it from us. And I'm, I'm not talking about <laughs> like, that's fake joy. <laughs> that's not real. That's not real happiness. It drives me nuts when I see people type LOL or a laughing emoji face, and they're like, I'm like, man, that is such fake joy. <laughs> Sin can do that to you, though. Not the texting part, but it, that's a good analogy. It can zap the joy from you, really on the inside. And David said it this way. He wrote the book of Psalms. He said, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. That word blessed, the Old Testament is written, the original language, the original text is in Hebrew. That word blessed doesn't mean, like, I got a lot of stuff. That word blessed means internally happy, internally happy. So happy is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Happy is the one whose sin is in the Lord, with the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. In other words, of course I'm happy. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not trying to conceal anything. Does not mean I'm perfect? No, but I'm not hiding anything. I know I'm clean with God. When I kept silent, in other words, when I tried to do it myself, when I didn't bring others in, my bones wasted away. Some of you feel that. Through my groaning, my mourning, my pain, my sadness, my depression all day long. David describes it this way. For day and night, it felt like God's hand was heavy on me, like heavy. My strength was zapped. It was sapped from me, as in, I feel like I'm in the oven with you, God. I'm in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I decided, hey, I'm done. This is what David's saying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess it. I'm going to share it with you, God. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. And now that we've walked through that passage, we can understand this last verse. Yes, rejoice. Woohoo! And I'm not kidding. He's, he's happy, internally happy. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. See, you can rejoice when you're not carrying all that anymore, right? You can rejoice. So sin, it really steals our joy. It can steal our joy. We have to be careful of that. The second thing sin does is that sin kills our lives. Sin kills our lives. In other words, it pollutes. It pollutes. And it pollutes not just your life, but it starts to pollute your marriage, your dreams, your work, your family. 
it pollutes. It's like toxic and it leaks out. And what ends up happening is when it leaks out enough, enough of the polluting happens, you have what I call a come to Jesus moment. And if you don't know what that is, that's a moment in your life where all hell breaks loose. And God doesn't create that. Hear this. God doesn't create that, but he certainly will use it. He will. And I had a lot of come to Jesus moments in my life. Amen. (laughs) But there's one specifically. When I was in high school, man, I thought I was the coolest cat alive. I thought I was, I'm that, I'm that guy. You know, I played football. I was good at it. I back talked to teachers. Unfortunately, I was good at that too. I knew how to make them look silly. I think it's the Lord's justice that I'm married to a teacher now and she teaches me something every single day. Amen. <laughs> the Lord's justice is perfect. You know, I cheated on tests. There's a period where I actually had three girlfriends at the same time. I know, real bad. But I, I was smart. I had to figure it out. I had a church girlfriend, a high school girlfriend, and then a college age girlfriend. No, it's not good. Not good. Well, there was my come to Jesus moment really bird. There was this one point where I decided, man, I'm going to skip school with my college girlfriend. I'm going to skip school. And so I planned it all out. See, I was too smart for a 15 year old. I didn't drive, so I had to plan it all out. I decided I picked a day where I knew my parents would be in staff meetings all day, so they'd be busy. I decided to be picked up and dropped off at high traffic times in the parking lot, so I would blend in with all the kids coming in and out. And I even had uh, my girlfriend at the time buy me a rated R movie ticket. And so, yeah, thank God I'm a pastor now, right? (laughs) But I had it all figured out. And so I skipped school that day with her, and she dropped me back off at school, and I went to football practice. And I remember being in the locker room regaling my my adventures with my football buddies, and I was high-fiving them, smiling. But on the inside, I kid you not, I was heavier than ever. Smiles on the outside, but I was miserable on the inside because I knew what I had done was not right. And I had this shame and this guilt and this feeling, I'm going to get caught. Well, I went home, and my parents weren't any the wiser. They asked me how school was, and fine, fine. Well, the next morning, lo and behold, I didn't know this, but there was one of my ex-girlfriends, more God's poetic justice, had seen me get out of the vehicle of my girlfriend's car being dropped back off at school, and she called her mom, who went to our church, who called my mom while she was driving me to school that morning. And I remember seeing the caller ID show up on my mom's phone, and oh, no, but I didn't say that. (laughs) I'm in trouble. And she answered the phone, and I wanted to best describe this moment to you. And so if you're on the dream team here, you know there's a kind of half joke, half truth we have with Pastor Sharon, she, sometimes when she looks at you and she's hearing the Holy Spirit, it can feel like she's looking into your soul. And so combine that with, if you've ever seen Indiana Jones at the end of the first movie, when the Nazis open the ark and their face melts, yes. So she answered the phone, hello, she looks at me, did you skip school yesterday? (laughs) My face melted and I knew I was in trouble. I knew my sins had caught up to me. Man, it can become slippery ground, can it? It can catch us quickly. David says, he's talking about it this way, he says it's slippery ground when we do those things and we get cast down to ruin, how suddenly they're destroyed and completely swept away by terrors. Once again, God doesn't create this situation, but he will use it. See, things will start to fall apart for you, and God's really trying to use that as a wake-up call for you. See, I wish I hadn't made that decision, and there were still consequences. There was a lot of uh, pain that came out of that, not just for me. It was, it was polluted other people. People left our church. I got suspensions, detentions. There was a lot of pain in a lot of families and in the church, and, but I'm thankful that I serve a God who's into restoring his people. Amen? And, you know, one of the things that came out of that, I won't go into all the detail, one of the things that came out of that was I served on the Vineyard Kids team for two years after that with my cousin. And in that time, the Lord restored some things, healed some things in me. And my cousin Justin and I, we got to minister to these young kids, and we led some of them to Jesus, two- and three-year-olds. And we, you know, taught them things, watched Veggie Tales, had fun with them. And some of those seeds we had planted are producing fruit today. We have some of those kids. I just saw them serving on the production team last week. Some of them were sitting up front. God is into restoring his people. And I'm trying to minister to somebody right now because you're on a slippery ground. And I'm telling you, you don't have to wait till you hit the bottom. God can catch you right where you're at, and he can use it. It's never too bad. It's never too bad. That's why we call this process here at Vineyard Finding Freedom, because it's a process. It's a path we have to walk out. And some of you have been carrying that shame. You've been carrying that guilt, and it's eating you alive. See, sin, it destroys 
our life. It steals our joy. And the third thing, you might not have thought of this one, but sin also destroys our identity. It steals our joy, kills our lives, and it destroys our identity. David said it this way, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. I am bowed down and brought low. See, some of you are living a version different than the person God wants you to be and who he created you to be. See, some of you, you've let your sin even take your identity. Well, my grandfather drank, my dad drank, I drink. We're drinkers. We're not changing. We're not changing. You've taken on that identity of that thing you continually do. That's just, it's not going away. See, sin can do that. It can rob you of your identity. But hear this, friends. You do not have to take on that identity. You do not. That thing you do or slip up with, that's not who you are. I don't see you that way, and God doesn't see you that way. Somebody needed to hear that, that that's not who you are. You don't have to take that identity on because it robs you of your life. I wanted to say it this way, is that we cannot be guilty and happy at the same time. You can't, you can't do both. You can't carry the guilt and the shame and be joyful at the same time. Okay, Samuel, what do we do? What, how do, what do I do? Well... The Bible makes it very simple, which is what I love about the Bible. It's a very simple word that really has some negative connotation with it. And sadly, the churches help make it a negative word a little bit. But it's so positive in Scripture. It's so positive. And it's the word repent. Repent. And repent's not like, repent, repent. It's not the person at the oceanfront or on the corner of the street. Turn or burn. That's not what repent is. Let me show you repent. I wanted to illustrate it for you. It's this. You'll miss it if it happens fast. In case you missed it, let me show you again. Repent is I'm going this direction, and I make a decision to go this direction. It's as simple as that. And here's the powerful part. It's a daily choice. It's a daily choice. Watch what happens when we actually do that. Paul helps explain it in case we didn't get it there with my illustration. Now repent, turn to God. Turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then what times of refreshment? Ooh, and I want that so bad for you. I want you to wake up and feel refreshed, regardless of what's going on around you and in your world and in your life. You, I can't control the circumstances around you, but you can control what's going on inside of you. You can. And it's produced in one place, the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. What happiness and joy... Po- Uh, David says, for those whose guilt has been forgiven, what joys when sins are covered over. David goes on, still talking here. What relief, relief, joy, peace, comfort for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. You can have that relief, that joy. And that's what I want to talk about today. It's as simple as repenting, repenting. We're going to talk about that. It's very easy. Last week, we outlined a passage in Philippians verse by verse talking about prayer that is the first choice we have to make, prayer first. But today, the message is called a daily choice, and it's a daily choice of repenting. And I wanted to do the same thing I did last week, just outline a passage for you. And so I prayed, Lord, give me a passage that's a really good repentance passage. And really, the best passage in Scripture for repentance is in Psalms. It's David, King David, if you know the story. He writes this right after he has an affair with Bathsheba. Really, he rapes her. And then he kills her husband, Uriah. He murders her to cover it up. So he's in a low place. And he writes this passage, this verse. He's been caught, and he writes this passage of repentance. And he really says four things. There's four things, and I want to highlight those four things for you. David says, wash me, cleanse me, create in me, and restore me. Wash me, cleanse me, create in me, and restore me. David says this. We're looking at it right here. David's talking. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And this is a choice we have to make every day. It's something you do every single day. You choose, I'm going to follow, not myself today, I'm going to follow God. I want you to write it down in your notes this way. It's I'm going to make a daily choice to put to death my old sin nature. It's a daily choice. And this is not a salvation moment. Christians need to learn to practice this every single day. Because having joy requires putting this to death every single day, being guilt-free. It's making a daily choice. See, I'm going to be honest. My thing I have to put to death every single day is I'm impatient. I'm impatient. And that can quickly lead to anger. See, I'm a type A personality, if you didn't get that. I'm a, I like to say, you know, I'm a leader, and I like to take the hill. We're going to take it. We're going. 
But what can happen is that I can quickly push other people over, run them over. People I care about, you're in my way. And so I have to, my only prescription for that is every single day making a decision to put that to death. Lord, I'm not going to be that way today. Lord, help me to see people as you do. Help me to love people as you do. Mm, Some of you need to hear this. You might be saying to yourself, well, that's my natural tendency. I'm a type A person too. That's my natural tendency. But God created us to be more than our natural tendencies. He really did. We're called to more. We're called to live more than that. So God, would you help me see people not, not bend into my natural tendencies, Lord, whatever those may be, but Lord, to actually walk out the plan you have for my life. Lord, help me to be the person you wanted me to be. I put to death Galatians 5. I pick up my cross every single day. And you have to do it every single day because your sin nature, it's like a zombie. <laughs> you go to bed, <clears throat> it comes back the next morning. And if I don't do it every day, man, I can slip right back into it. See, Paul says it this way in Romans 8. He says, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you guys, he's not talking to just everybody. He's talking to Christians. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You don't have to do it. He's not talking about heaven or hell here. He's talking about your quality of life here right now. That you can choose to follow your plan or you can make a daily choice to follow God's plan. And what happens is if I, let, if I just go along with what my nature tells me to do, I will die. And he's not talking about physical death. He's talking about a spiritual death to our dreams, to our marriage, to our family. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit, that's God's presence, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. You will have life. You will have joy. You will have joy. So we need to make, take a moment every day and make that daily choice. Man, I'm going to follow God today. I'm not going to follow my sinful nature. I'm going to follow God. The second thing David says after wash me is cleanse me. Cleanse me. That's something deeper. Washing is like on the outside, right? Hey, I'm washed off. Cleansing is where we say, God, I'm going to let you work on some stuff I'm carrying within. Some hurts, some habits, some unforgiveness, some, some habitual things I do. And they might not all be horrible, but they're not the best version of you. And that's why God wants to cleanse those things. And I want you to write it down this way. It's that we're going to make a daily choice to release my past and take another step towards freedom. See, what happens is when you make that daily choice, you spend that time in prayer, pray first. What God does, at least he does for me, is he starts, ooh, Samuel, let's work on that. Samuel, let's work on this next. It's like peeling back an onion. There's layers. And he keeps revealing, let's work on this. And really, here's the secret for this, the cleansing part, is God's prescription for this is with other Christians. It's with other people. James 5 16 says, make this your common practice, a daily choice to confess your sins, not just to God, but to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. See, the prayer of a person living that way, whole and healed, is something powerful. It's powerful. It's powerful. In a lot of ways, that means we can communicate with God more clearly. Communicate with him. That's why I'm excited for our fall semester of the Vineyard Network. It's our groups. And the power of groups, if you haven't been in one, is really what happens is it's a process, but you get to a place where you go, I think I can tell them. I think I can share that with them. I trust them enough. And when you do that, man, it's powerful. It's finding freedom. So wash me. Cleanse me. David then says, create in me. Create in me. So every place where there's destruction, brokenness, bad things, would you take those out and replace it with purpose? destiny. I want you to write it down this way. We have to make a daily choice to pursue God's plan for our lives. It's a daily decision. We have to daily decide who we are living for. I do this every single day. I pray about a lot, but I get to a place in my prayer, and I'm I'm not kidding. Every single day, I get to a place where I go, God, I don't want to follow Samuel's plan. I want to follow your plan. I want to follow your plan. See, I can slip really easily into going, God, if I serve you and follow you, then my plan will work out, right? (laughs) No, I want to follow God's plan. Why? Well, Scripture says we're not to copy the behaviors and customs of this world. This is Paul talking. But be transformed into a new person by changing the way you think. And what happens when you think about it differently, when you come into that new way, you learn God's will for you. And what God's will for you is it's good, pleasing, and what? Perfect. Perfect. God's will is not bad for you, my friends. Scripture says his plans are to bless you and to prosper you, not to harm you. 
See, it's why we talk about growth tracks so much here. Because we want you to be on a track of growth where you're continually finding the best version of who you are. Did you know you were created uniquely? Did you know God gave you spiritual gifts? Did you know God, your personality is God-given and there's a purpose with that? Did you know that joy is found in being mobilized with Jesus? When you're in motion with God, serving others, because in that moment we really step into the shoes of Jesus, there's fulfillment and there's joy in that. So David says, wash me, cleanse me, create in me something new. And then he says, restore me. I want you to highlight, circle, underline this, the joy of salvation. Joy of salvation. What is that? What is that? Well, it's where I'm doing something with it now. What he's created in me. I'm teaching others. I'm turning people to you. I'm influencing others. I'm impacting others for the name of Jesus Christ. This is the deeper part of Vineyard, my friends, right here. It's when you're mobilized, when you're making a difference with your life. You know, the scripture talks about how there's the meat and the milk. There's a deeper part to our faith. The meat is right here. The meat is in the streets. It's not in the Greek. It's in the streets, my friends. The deeper part of your faith, the fulfillment, the joy is found in making a difference with your life. Making a difference. And that's why I want this so bad for you, that we need to make a daily choice to live a life that impacts others. We're going to make a daily choice. And you will never know the joy of salvation until you're doing that. And don't take my word for it. Ask a dream teamer. Ask a camera person, somebody serving on lights. Ask a cafe dream teamer. Ask a kids team person. Ask a worship team member. They look like they were living in that today, didn't they? That's the joy I want for you so bad. See, Psalm says, Lord, you have made the path known to me, and I know there's life at the end of the path. And then this morning I was reading in Proverbs that the people who don't live in this, their path goes nowhere. It feels like a maze where there's dead ends and detours. That's not the life of joy. So we have to make some choices. We have to get to a place where we go, God, wash me. Lord, I give you my sin. I let you wash those things. Wash the shame and the guilt off of me. Lord, I accept your gift of Jesus. I accept that. We get to a place where we say, Lord, now cleanse me. Go deeper. Would you help me find freedom in those areas that are broken or I need healing, Father, those pains, those habits I need to let go? Would you create in me? Help me discover my purpose. Lord, restore me to the joy of salvation. I want that the way Samuel described it. I want that fulfillment. I want that joy. And here's the kicker, my friends, is that I can talk to you about it all day long, but you will never know that joy. You'll never experience it until you take those steps. That's the truth, is you won't experience it until you take those steps. And that's my dream for you. That is my dream. I kid you not. My goal is not to pack this auditorium with multiple services. We've done that before. I used to think that was the goal. It's not. No, my goal for you is that you would hear the message. You would come around enough where you get to a place where you just are tired and you say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to take a step now. I'm tired of being stuck where I am. I'm going to make a step. I'm going to take a step. I'm going to... I'm tired of carrying my sin. I'm going to give it to Jesus today. Man, I'm tired of that habit I can't seem to kick. I'm going to get in a small group. I'm going to be in the Vineyard Network. I'm going to see what that's about. Man, I'm tired of just going day in and day out, feeling like I have no purpose. I'm going to go to Growth Track. I'm going to see what that's all about. Man, I'm going to get on the dream team, and I'm going to go to bed every night laying my head in the pillow like they do, knowing I made a difference with my life. That's my goal for you. And see, that whole message is summarized in this thought, is that joy is more than a feeling. It's a way of living. It's a way of life, my friends, and I want it so bad for you. And I invite you into that way of life. Real joy is found there. Let's close in prayer. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Holy Spirit, we just ask for more of your presence. You're already here, God, but Lord, I pray that the white noise, the things that Mm, yeah, the things of this coming week would just be quieted. That in this moment, we'd be able to focus on you, God. Mm, I spoke this word last night, and I feel it again this morning, that there's some of you in here that have not heard the Lord's voice before. You don't recognize it. And I want you to listen right now. I want you to hear God right now. How you do that is you open your heart to God.
keep focusing on God and listen to me. There's some of you in here that need some things removed. You're carrying some shame and some guilt, and you, you get to make a choice today. You can carry it out with you again, or you can leave it here with God. But it's a choice. It's a choice you have to make. Some of you have been carrying that shame and guilt, and you've been numbing the pain. You know who you are. You know what it is, whether it's drinking, pornography, I don't know, but you know what it is. Mm. And the Spirit wants you to hear this, that you've come to a place where you've justified it, where you say, well, that's just life. You know, I need to de-stress somehow. But friends, that's not the solution. The solution is a clear conscience before God. It's giving it to God. Samuel, how do I do that? Okay, I, I want to give it to God. What does that look like? Well, God really wants one thing that he doesn't have, and that's your sin. Your sin. You have to give it to him. See, God wants your sin so bad that he put the entirety of human sin on the person he loved most, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the wages of sin are death. In other words, we have a bill to pay when we've sinned and we've all sinned. There's a bill to pay. But the Bible says there was one person who did not sin and that was Jesus. Jesus paid our bill when he hung on the cross for grueling hours dying. And when he died, he paid our bill. So friend, you do not have to pay that bill. You can, but it doesn't make sense. You don't have to. See, God wants your sin. Let Jesus have your sin. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to give your sin to Jesus, if you're tired of carrying that shame and that guilt, that sin, I want to pray with you. That's how you do it. It's through prayer. I'm not going to make you stand up or cut, run down front. I want to pray with you right where you are, okay? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, there's some of you in here that you're ready to give it to God or you're thinking about it. Yeah, I hear that. You're thinking about it. And I want you to make up your mind right now you're going to give it to God. Give your sin to God, okay? I want you to pray with me. And I want you to make a motion towards God so I know who I'm praying with. So if you want to pray with me, if you want to give your sin to God, would you raise your hand right now so I can see who I'm praying with? Raise it high so I can see it. I see that. Yes. Yes. Yep, I see that. I see that. I see that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I see that. Okay, you can put your hands down their hands all over the room. You put them down. We're going to pray together now. Why don't you just repeat after me? You can whisper it at your seat. I'll help you with the words. You just believe it. If you say, Jesus, this morning I make a decision. I go all in with you. I give you my life. Say it this way. I don't want to be in control anymore. So right now I receive your forgiveness. Thank you for loving me unconditionally. Thank you for having a plan and a purpose for my life. I believe it and I receive it. Jesus, from this moment forward, I plan to live my life for you as best I know how. Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, Create in me, restore me. Whisper this right where you are. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Today I turn towards you, and I'll never be the same. I love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Vineyard, there are hands all over the room. Would you celebrate with those who made that decision? Well, we're going to close with one worship song. Uh, and I want to speak directly to those of you who prayed with me. If you prayed with me online, there's a button you can click that said you made that decision. If you're here in person, there's a next step. We all have a next step. I've got a next step. We have a next step to take. If you prayed with me, your next step is there's a connect card attached to your program. There's a place on there where you can say, I did pray with you, Samuel. And you drop that in the clear box on your way out. Everybody, there's also a place for prayer requests on there. I encourage you to fill that out, throw it in there. That way, you know, we're anonymous when we're throwing in who's throwing what. 
you know, but there are places where our prayer team prays for you guys daily with that. So, but if you did pray with me, please, please take that step. Here's why. I'm not gonna show up to your house. We're not gonna call you. We're gonna send you an email with some next steps, some next steps because that cleansing process, we want that so bad for you. And there's a lot of great churches. I'm biased, I love this one. There's a lot of great churches and we wanna help you find a home church. Well, hey, today, as Noah mentioned, is step four of Growth Track. And the Lord put on my heart specific people today. That's those of you who were sidelined either by COVID or some other life thing that just took you out of the game and your spiritual health has been a little off. And I'm telling you, it's because you're not serving. Don't do it for me, don't do it for the church, do it for yourself. If you read scripture, you find out that God created you to serve because in that we share the love of Jesus for others. And when you wear that, you find fulfillment, you find joy. So I encourage you, come to step four today, jump, take that step, it's powerful. We're gonna close with one last song and as we sing this last song, we're going to give what's on our hearts to give so you can get that out. If you're a guest here, please don't feel any pressure at all to give, okay? It's for those who call Vineyard Church their home. Uh, most of you give electronically now, and I just want to say thank you to those who give. You know, you're very near and dear to my heart. You help mobilize this church because the local church, when it's mobilized, is the hope of the world. And we're responding to those fires in the Midwest and West right now. We're doing that because of your giving. So thank you for helping us be able to serve those people and share the love of Jesus at the same time. Well, let's go ahead and give and sing. Let's all stand together as we close with this last song. Lord, I just pray as we close service, Lord, would you receive our worship? Would you receive our offerings? Would you receive our tithes? Lord Jesus, would you use it to make your name more known to those who do not know you? Jesus, we give you all the glory and praise in your mighty name. Let's sing.